Uh, hi, welcome to our session on uh, uh, employment and when it will ever get better. We, we, I was just saying here, we were just talking at the front that this is a very interesting subject right now. We hope that in a year or two it won't be so interesting. Um, my name's Orly Ashenfelder, and I'm going to sort of act as your moderator uh, as best I can. There's, there are three handouts, one uh, from the two ads and, and one from me, which is just a simple thing with numbers in it. I wanted to put this out here because we, we're going to actually, everything, will, there'll be some charts for you to look at, and, and the employment situation is one we're all interested in. But it's very confusing in my mind when it's reported by the press. And I wanted to show you how that was and also show you the numbers that most of us look at if you're a professional when this comes out. Ed, Ed McKelvey is going to speak today um, about his views on where we are and where we're going. Okay, thanks, Arlie. Uh, the reason we have all these numbers is so we can have more economists to analyze them. Um, I'm going to sketch out uh, a couple of different uh, models of employment. I'm going to try to do this all in 10 minutes. I uh, promise to do that and um, tell you a little bit about why we uh, think what we think. Uh, the slide, the first slide just shows our forecast relative to consensus, and the only point of including it besides propaganda is to um, uh, say that we are below consensus all the way around. We have a very slow growth view, and a key reason for that is because we are fairly cautious uh, about the prospects for job growth. And I will confess that much of what you're going to hear about here is based on the, uh, uh, on the uh, survey of establishments, the payrolls uh, that uh, are, are in, are in uh, Orly's third chart. In the first eight uh, cycles in the United States after World War II, employment pretty routinely grew pretty quickly after the cycle started. So you get the first stirrings of demand within three, or th three to six months after that. You already had companies hiring people, and within a year, you were up about 2% at a minimum, as, mu as much as 4.5% in some recoveries. So what was essentially happening in that situation was the labor market kicked in very quickly and transformed the, the very first kindling of recovery into a, a full-scale full recovery. Uh, in the last couple cycles, we discovered that that's not always the way the world works, and we had what, were, what are now called the jobless recoveries, where employers were much more cautious and <coughs> did not hire new workers, and consequently those recoveries were much more, much, much more subdued. And it took a long time to turn the unemployment rate around because we weren't creating those jobs uh, necessary to uh, employ all the people coming into the workforce. So which way are we going to have it this time? Uh, so far, if you look at slide three, we are actually on the, the jobless track. And we're actually, I, I didn't get uh, the last numbers in here because I printed this up the day before the unemployment numbers came out on Friday. Uh, so the last plotting there is January, actually. And it would be still slightly lower. But you see that we are already tracking on the so-called jobless track. We have shed more workers. Now, this assumes that the business cycle ended in June of last year, that that was the low point in, in economic activity. And I think that's a reasonably good assumption. But you can also see if you sl slid that thick line over a month or two, it wouldn't really change the story very much. So which one will we follow this time? Those who argue for strong recovery essentially say, well, those jobless recoveries followed very shallow recessions. This has clearly not been a shallow recession. This has been the deepest recession of the post-war era. What goes down must come up. You get the so-called rubber band effect. We've <coughs> fired over 8 million workers. How can companies not rehire? And in many cases, people will say companies have overfired workers. They fired more workers than would have been justified by the declines in, in GDP. The other view, which is the one we, we embrace, is that the jobless recoveries were really a, a reflection of structural change in the economy, a completely new business environment that was emerging during the 1980s, and that even if the jobless recoveries aren't reflective of that, that companies discovered, as they were more cautious in their hiring practices, that there were substantial benefits in that caution in the form of productivity growth, 
and profit growth, and that they'll, therefore they'll continue those practices. And with respect to the current cycle on specific issues, we do not think companies have overfired, at least not in the aggregate. We certainly could imagine industries and companies that probably have done so. And the economy is actually currently swimming in excess labor capacity, some of which is uh, listed as employed and some of which is outside the labor market. And so we basic, I, I want to expand a little bit more on, on why, what these structural changes were. And, and I'll, I'll do so by describing um, a, a, a kind of a line of research that Bill Dudley and I started in the late 1990s at Goldman. Uh, called the Brave New Business Cycle. This is actually a theory that sort of is partly related to the so-called great moderation that people have talked about that GDP, at least up until a couple of years ago, was following a much more moderate uh, uh, path of, of down uh, and up. Uh, the topic for this session is when will jobs return? And uh, I'm going to use uh, a little bit of economist license to not answer that question and talk about some other things, but also related to the labor market. Uh, I want to do three things, actually, in ten minutes. First, I want to talk about um, the stimulus in jobs and how much of what we have seen in terms of the turnaround from uh, first quarter of 2009 to uh, last quarter of 2009 uh, has to do with the stimulus. I'm going to take a, quite a different view from the one that uh, John Lipsky uh, uh, expressed this morning. Second, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the uh, jobs bill that is currently um, uh, going through Congress uh, that would subsidize uh, employment, to tell you what I think the effects of that will be. And then third, and this is a special request from Orly, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the auto bailout and uh, why we did that. Um, so, uh, and that is also jobs related because that, that obviously was the answer. Uh, and the question is why did we do it in the particular way that we did it. So uh, those are the three topics. Um, the, uh, it, now just some of you may not know my background, so I just have to say one thing, and that is that um, I, I, when, I, when I say we, I'm talking about we being the Bush administration. I was the president's uh, chief economic guy during the last three years of that administration. And so many of the things that I'll talk about, in particular the stimulus, uh, will refer back to that. So, okay, what about the stimulus? Why do we care about that? Well, obviously, I think the reason we care about that is that when we're thinking about policies for the future and future recessions and how we deal with these things, we have to know whether the policies worked. You know, there was a, a year ago, everybody decided that Keynesian economics was, was back uh, because we didn't know what else to do, and we were just kind of praying that it was back. Um, and so the question is, is it? Uh, did it work? Uh, I, I believe that the numbers like two million jobs that uh, have been thrown out uh, being saved or created are simply not, not accurate. Uh, I think they are a, a, a very large overstatement of what actually happened. The way that you get to numbers like two million jobs uh, is essentially by using the model rather than the data. Uh, so if you look at the CBO report, or if you look at the uh, CEA report, or if you look at reports by other organizations that use large effects, essentially what they do is they predict the effect even before they see the data, and it doesn't change when they see the data because it doesn't matter. What they're doing is they're using the model. That's not a criticism. They're very upfront about it. If you read the CBO report, they will tell you that their estimate of the effect of the stimulus is based on the model and not on the data. Uh, which means what they do is they take a Keynesian model, they say, let's see how much spending we hit the economy with, let's use classic estimates of the multiplier, figure that out, and then use something that economists call Oaken's Law. Oaken's Law is the transformation of GDP growth into job growth, and then they just calculate the number of jobs, okay? So it's a model-based approach. Um, now, uh, I don't believe that's, that's a very good way to look at it, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data that, that will refute that. First of all, uh, let me tell you that uh, I, I always object when people say that, that we're talking about a second stimulus. We're actually talking about a third stimulus. The first stimulus was ours, uh, ours being the Bush administration stimulus. Uh, we did that in, as you may recall, there were the tax rebate checks in May and June of 2008. Um, I was one of the, the primary people involved in figuring out whether we should do that or not. We presented to the president back in November of 2007. Uh, but at that point, we didn't have any data showing that the economy was in trouble. Uh, growth rates were actually quite high for the previous two quarters. But we had a sense that things might be going in the wrong direction. And so we decided to do that. Um, I'm certainly happy to uh, talk to you about that later in the, in the Q&A.